Now, we have been talking about faith and the inconsistency in faith. So I'm going to pull this first slide, why there is an inconsistent result with my faith, meaning why does it work one time and not the next? And we talked about finding the specific will of God last week. Now, I'm not going to go into that any more than to just mention that when Jesus healed the man at the pool, he did not heal the others that we know of. Also, Jesus initiated that healing, which is not a common occurrence in the Word of God. He did it a few times, but most of the testimony in the Word of God of people being healed it says that he healed all who came to him. So that's a distinction right there. Then we determined from that, that if he chose that one man out of all of the people who were around the pool, hoping to receive a miracle, and Jesus said, I do what I see my father do, and I say what I hear him say, then we're going to say that that was God, by the Spirit, leading Jesus for a specific purpose in that particular healing. Now, that does not exclude anyone from coming to Jesus for healing because the testimony of Scripture is all who came to him got healed. But it doesn't say that every sick person he ever saw, he healed that he just said, well, if I see a sick person, I'm going to heal them. It doesn't say that or imply it. And the reason I'm saying it doesn't even imply it is that particular scene at the pool. These were all people of various different types of sicknesses, and they were all wanting to be healed, yet he only chose the one out of that group to heal. So again, that's him initiating that healing. And then the other thing we talked about, Peter and John, I think it was, and the lame man at the gate, and he said, Do you, can you give me some silver and gold, some coins? And they said, silver and gold we don't have, but such as we have, we give you in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And it says that that man was sitting there daily. Therefore, Jesus walked by him and never initiated a healing. But here... He asked them, and they also were able to pray and him be raised up based on his asking. But he didn't ask for healing. He asked for silver and gold. So again, I'm going to say that's probably a manifestation of the Spirit, meaning that it was Spirit-led to do that. So we see two types of receiving from the Lord. All of it is the work of the Spirit, but one is the initiation of the recipient reaching out and asking for, which is the most common. And then the other is initiated by God as a demonstration of the Spirit. And therefore, when we read about the gifts of the Spirit, we're not going to read about them today, but when we read about the gifts of the Spirit, we see that the manifestation of the Spirit was a witness. It confirmed the testimony of Jesus by signs following. Therefore, there should be manifestations of the Spirit. So we say, well, all right, why is my faith inconsistent? And using the disciples, when they tried to cast out the devil out of the man's son, couldn't do it. They asked Jesus later, why could we not do it? We had success in the past, but we're not having success now. He said, because of your unbelief. Then we whittled that on down and discovered that when we, what I'm going to call, generally pray for anyone who comes and there for whatever reason, something doesn't happen, then we need to pray and look for if there is a specific 
thing that needs to be dealt with or done. Jesus said in the particular case of the demon coming out of the boy, he said this kind comes out by prayer, possibly prayer and fasting, but by prayer. But notice Jesus did not have to take time to pray. Therefore, he was prepared because he had been practicing as a lifestyle prayer that kept him in the position of, I'm ready for whatever comes along. But he was implying, you guys weren't ready for whatever comes along. Therefore, you tried to rise to the occasion, but apparently not in a state of mind of having prayed. Therefore, he said, you're going to get this one out. You're going to have to pray. I can get this one out. I don't have to pray because I've already prayed because I practice prayer. So that was the what we looked at last week. Now we're going to look at, again, because of a question. Well, this, this whole question came up in another class that I teach. And we were looking for why possible reasons for why maybe our faith didn't work or what we were believing for didn't happen. And I'm going to pull up two answers that were presented to me as possible reasons for the inconsistency in our faith. So I was recently confronted with a possible answer as to why there is an inconsistency in the results of our faith. First, the thought being, this was his response, all these died in faith, not having received the promises. Now, this is a true statement that all of these people died in faith, not having received the promises. This is speaking of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, and so on. And it's speaking about the promises of the land inheritance and the city whose builder is God. But what it doesn't say is that they didn't receive any promises. It says they died in faith, not having received what was promised. So the question is, there appears to be two types of promises. And, and I'm going to say in the case of the heroes of faith, there was the promises they did receive in their lifetime. And there was the promises that they died in faith, not having received, but are going to receive. They're going to receive. In other words, Abraham died in faith, not having seen the city whose builder was God, meaning that, that it came, that's going to be New Jerusalem, which has foundation stones and all of these things. And so he lived in a tent because he said, why build a house? I have a city coming. It's a promise of God. So that was one category. But then we know Abraham on the other side he was promised a child through whom the Messiah would come. And that child did come. So the question is, what is this promises we get, promises we don't get, and what is the distinguishing factor between them and how does this work? So is it possible that you and I will die in faith, not having received some of what we've been promised? Well, it's almost sure that we will die in faith, not having received some of what we were promised because what we've been promised is the same promise that was given to Abraham. There's a new Jerusalem coming. We're going to be residents. The likelihood of me <laughs> getting to receive that promise until the return of the Lord, which is not dependent upon me, but upon the Father. 
So it's very high probability that I am going to die in faith, believing what's coming, yet not having received all of what was promised. So I want us to catch that principle. This is a fact of walking with God. But again, what determines what can be received, what can't be received, and then what possibly could be received if everything worked together as it should, meaning that the specifications were met. And God has specifications. So I'll first I'll just introduce that. One specification is God is not willing that any men perish, meaning they don't receive eternal life. He said, it's my desire that all men be saved. But I have a specification. You must believe on my son. If you don't believe that, though it is my desire and paid for, that you receive eternal life, you don't meet that specification, you're not going to get it. Now, I'm saying that to say that then throws out the possibility of though God desires us to have certain things, that he's made it clear in the word of God, it's very clear that everybody doesn't get all of what God wants them to have in this life by not meeting the specifications. Now, I'm, I'm not saying, well, I'm not even gonna begin to try to cover all of the possible specifications and things that could apply to why we do, why we don't. I'm simply introducing that it is clear that if God lets men perish which is the biggest tragedy in human history, when their salvation was paid for, which is the biggest act of grace and God's love towards us, if he will allow unbelief to stop his gracious paid for act and men suffer the worst tragedy in human history because of unbelief, then that says unbelief is a powerful factor in order for us to walk with God. Unbelief is major. So I am simply saying that to say that is a specification that God requires. That is one. Now, that doesn't, I'm not saying that equally applies to all things because God says I reign on the just and the unjust. So meaning even the unjust people, the people who don't even believe in me, I still reign on them. So there's certain things I am able, because I'm gracious and paid for, there are certain things I'm able to do in spite of people but then there's certain things I'm not able to do. I can't save unbelievers who refuse to believe. I can't. I cannot do that. That is a specification that's of a category or caliber that it can't be, even God can't override it. We're not going to have people in the kingdom with us who said, I never was a believer, and he saved me anyway. I'm not a believer now, but he saved me anyway. I don't even believe Jesus is real, but he saved me anyway. There's not going to be one. You're not going to run across anybody like that. It's not going to happen. So it's telling us there's certain levels of specification for certain things that must be met. Otherwise, God will allow people to perish whom he loves and paid for their eternity with him. But nonetheless, they perish because they would not believe. So that's the specification part. Now, 
in looking at this, we're again, we're still looking to, to uh, understand this dilemma of what can I confidently believe God for that's not going to fall into the category of having died in faith, not having received the promise. That's one that I was presented with. And the second one is this one. Secondly, I was confronted with the possible answer of why our faith seems to be inconsistent or is inconsistent. And that is Hebrews 10, 34. For you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in the heavens or in heaven. So what's he saying here? Another possible reason for us not receiving, you know, when we're believing God, well, Lord, I'm believing you and my goods are being plundered. And this verse says, well, joyfully accept the plundering of your goods knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heavens, in the heavens. And so what this is saying is there are certain things that God has promised. We're going to read these that God has promised for us that walk with him. Yet on the other hand, it's very clear from scripture that some of those things could be plundered from me and I'm to joyfully accept the plundering of temporal blessing from God because I have something better in the heavens. So these were two propositions that were thrown out to me to say, maybe this is why our faith is seems inconsistent. In other words, what if I'm believing for New Jerusalem and I don't get to see it in my lifetime? Well, I'll die in faith, not having received but I will receive. So then the question is, okay, how far do, do these principles and how does it work? How can I confidently go about telling people and saying, Jesus died for your sins and you can believe on him and have eternal life and by his stripes you've been healed but I don't know that you'll receive these things in this life. Can I confidently say that by his stripes you'll be healed? Can I confidently say that if you will walk with God, that your enemies who come at you in one direction, he'll cause to flee in seven? What about the plundering of your goods? So what we have is we have some verses that create what I'm going to call a dilemma. <laughs> now, in saying the dilemma is there, I'm not going to try to answer it by saying, well, one of those is not right anymore. Everything God says is true, even if no weapon formed against me will prosper, but then I'm to joyfully accept the plundering of my goods. Well, wait. I thought the weapons formed against me weren't going to prosper. If I'm having to joyfully accept the plundering of my goods, the, the weapons formed against me are prospering. Is God not telling the truth? He's telling the truth in both cases. So the question is, well, wait, how does this work? How do I walk in confidence with God? Like if he says, go into all the world and I will be with you even unto the end of the age. Well, Lord, yeah, I hear you. You're saying you're going to be with me, but I could go out there and die right on the spot. Uh, yeah, that's right. Well, Lord, you said with long life will I satisfy them. Is that not true? Oh, no, that's true. Well, Lord, they can't both be true. Well, actually, they can both be true. And this is what we're wanting to try to deal with, this issue of how can I encourage people, believe God, trust God, do the will of God. You can trust him. He's with you. He does miracles. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
except in the case of those that he wasn't the same. No, he is the same. Now, let's, hopefully I've communicated the dilemma and let's deal with this. The dilemma, we're going to read two primary verses that will really make clear the dilemma. Psalm 103, verse 4 through 6, verse 4. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Now listen, and forget not all. Notice I've got all highlighted there. Forget not all his benefits. Who forgives your iniquities. Who heals, oop, there's that word again, all. Who heals all your diseases. Now, these are things written under the first covenant with the God who does not change. And we're in a new and better covenant based upon better promises. Who heals all your diseases. Better promises who heals all your diseases and redeems your life from destruction, even though you joyfully accept the plundering of your goods that you worked so hard for. Who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, while you joyfully accept the plundering of your refrigerator and storage cabinets. Who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for, here's the word again, all who are oppressed. Oh, it sounds pretty oppressing to me for somebody to be taking my goods, of which I'm then told joyfully accept the plundering of your goods. And yet, he executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. I would call that oppression. The plundering of my goods. So, what's the deal? Is Psalm 103 true? Psalm 103 is true. Is God telling the truth? Is he still the same yesterday, today, and forever? He is. Are we in a new and better covenant? We are. Well, um, there's some Sudani Christians who I think might differ with Psalm 103 saying we're walking with God and we're being hunted like animals. Our food is gone. They take it. They kill us. They abuse us. They harm us. Where's the Lord who executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed? We're oppressed. Where is he? The dilemma, the dilemma is all of these verses are true. The ones that I would say that we would call good and bad, you know, not that they're bad, but the ones that like joyfully accepting the plundering of your goods. And that's just one, I'm stating that one over and over as a principle. That's not the, even the worst sounding of things that can happen to us. But the dilemma in all these verses are true, meaning the things that are promised us good and then the things that tell us to prepare for bad. Us, the righteous people of whom God's going to execute justice and righteousness. So I'm going to try to reconcile the dilemma without taking a position that one of these is not true. They're both true but that both are true in their correct context. What is context? Context, in this, it will say in the sense of writing, a word gets its meaning by the context that it's used. You've heard me say this before, the word key. 
What does the word key mean? Well, people say, well, the word key literally means, what does it literally mean? When you say literal meaning, do you mean this is the meaning of the word key? But the word key doesn't have a literal meaning. It has a meaning based on the context in which it's used. The key for your car is one thing. A key for the exam you have to take at the end of the year is another thing. The key on a basketball court is another thing. That's where they shoot the free throws from in the, the basketball game. So to say there's a literal meaning to key, so key means something in the context of the sentence, the way it's used. The promises of God are the same. They are true in their right context. Now, I'm not saying this to say that sometimes they're true and sometimes they're not. They're always true in their context. Always true. The question is, have we taken a position or a view towards the word of God that I can take a promise, pull it out, and apply it in any context I want, and then expect what the promise says? Because after all, all the promises of God are yes in Christ and amen in Christ. Therefore, I can take that promise and I can put it into any context I want. And it is true because I'm in Christ and all the promises are yes and amen. But because the word of God says that all the promises are yes and amen in, in him, in Christ, it doesn't mean out of context, they're yes and amen. It's meaning in the context. So here's the question, and this one's going to be the one we're going to kind of, or at least I did, because I'm looking for this answer. I want to know the truth. I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to take a position that, for example, this was our discussion <laughs> that I said those other two positions were presented to me, and that is God healing today. Does God heal today? Yes, he does. Does he do miracles? Yes, he does. Do we see as many as we should be seeing? No, we don't, but it's not him. It's us. Well, what if some people's healings or miracles or whatever, what if God says, yes, by Jesus stripes you're healed, but you're going to receive that when Abraham receives the city. Well, there's no question. If we die, we're going to be before the Lord and to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. We will be with him forevermore. And when I'm standing there, I'm not gonna, you know, have to get up slow and say, oh, ah, and I'm not gonna have pain shoot down my left leg and those types of things. No, it's not gonna be happening. Not when I'm standing in the presence of the Lord. So in that sense, that's true. There is a manifestation on the other side that won't totally be realized in this life. But does that mean then that the promise of healing is really meant for the other side? So we shouldn't be doing as Jesus did, going about doing good and healing all who are oppressed of the devil. Therefore, when Jesus said, the things that I do, you shall do also, and greater things than these shall you do, not speaking of the atonement, none of us could get involved in that. So therefore, he's saying these supernatural things that I'm doing, you shall do also, but none of it's going to be realized until the other side, or as it says that the testimony of Jesus was confirmed by manifestations of the Holy Spirit and power. God confirming the word preached with signs following. Not, not that they actually did anything here. The sign was, you'll get it on the other side. No, that's not what the word of God tells us. So the word of God tells us there should be some type of manifestations 
in regard to the things that fall within the context of what we're supposed to be doing. So I hope you're tracking with me on that. So now let's go to our next slide. Now this is Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. I'm wanting to put us in our context. What I'm going to call the Christian or Messianic believer in Jesus, the Messiah, son of the living God. If we're going to walk in the things of God like he wants us to, we're going to have to live in a particular context. And the primary context that we have to live is in the will of God. But listen to what he says. Now, I want us to see something, though, because we're looking for, Lord, how does this work? How does Psalm 103 work with joyfully accepting the plundering of my goods? And you're my great deliverer, and I'm not to forget your benefits, your promises. So, again, Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin, and have neglected or called part of the word of God no longer true. That's what Jesus used to do, but he doesn't do that anymore. Only because you don't have an answer for the dilemma, so you just mark off part of the word of God. Well, listen to what Jesus says to the Pharisees who were doing the same things. For you pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin, but have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Weightier matters of the law? What's Jesus saying here? Justice and mercy and faith. Notice that he calls faith a weighty matter of the law. Justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done, meaning the mint, anise, and cumin, without leaving the others undone, without saying, well, people don't get healed today because God doesn't heal anymore. God doesn't speak anymore. He gave us the Bible. God doesn't do anything supernatural anymore because we don't know how to walk in it. We say he doesn't do it anymore. I think Jesus would say, I think Western Christianity is neglecting weightier matters of the law. Oh, we're experts in Calvinism, Arminianism, but we're not experts in the weightier matters of the law like justice, mercy, and faith. What Jesus is saying is there are weightier matters in walking with God. Now, why am I saying this? Because what we're going to see, and there's an answer, at least to me, it's clear. What we're going to see is we have elevated all the promises of God, our yes in Christ and amen in him. That is a true statement. But all the promises of God are not of the same weight. They are all yes, but there are weightier matters. So what happens if due to the world being corrupted and there's sin in the world, there's corruption in the church, and due to all of that, there arises a conflict between two promises being performed in your life, but one is of a weightier matter. Which one does God give the nod to? The weightier matter or the one you like best? Folks, this is a fact of walking with God. Everything in your life that may be of magnanimous importance to you is not as important to God as the weightier matters. And we've got to realize, I wonder if this is what he was talking about when he said, seek first the kingdom. 
Why did he give it the title first? Seek first the kingdom. I think it's a weighty matter. I think if you shift the importance of the kingdom in God's economy, you start dealing with cumin and anise and mint and you think you're wielding the big issues of the kingdom. And he's saying, oh, no, 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 no. There's weightier matters. And if you get in a conflict over the lightweight matters. Now, listen, I'm not saying any promise God made is good. And I believe it is, yes, and he will gladly give us everything in the word of God as long as it does not create a conflict in us over a weightier matter. For example, the apostle Paul, he said, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, whatever it was. Some people, because they're, in which I believe in healing. I believe in healing, hook, line, and sinker. I believe in healing. But because they've taken a position, they believe in healing, they say, well, that was not really a thorn in the flesh. It was maybe oppression or persecution. Okay, let's say oppression. Okay, let's say persecution. That he was given persecution wherever he went. Nonetheless, he was opposed. And the truth is you might prefer a hangnail to persecution. But whatever it was, he was given that. Why? It was a spirit of the enemy behind it. Why was he allowed to be buffeted by this thing? Why did God say to him, my grace is sufficient? Listen to what Paul said. He said, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh to buffet me lest, uh oh, this might be a weightier matter than him being delivered from his thorn in the flesh. Lest I be lifted up with pride, the sin that brought Satan down. Lest I be lifted up with pride because of the abundance of the gracious revelation God has given me. What if I go over the edge like Satan? But God knew I need Paul for kingdom purposes. I cannot let him go over the edge in pride. Therefore, I'll allow him to be buffeted. And though he asked me to relieve him from it, the weightier matter is that he stay true to the kingdom. Not just for his sake, but for the kingdom's sake. Therefore, the context of the promises of God, which Paul did in miracles, people were healed under Paul's ministry. Yet, he, he had an, a messenger of Satan to buffet him that he could not shake. Why? It's an issue of the weightier matter. God is concerned about the weightier matter. We have to bring this into our thinking. Does that mean we can't say, well, well, we can't pray for the sick people because we don't know what the weightier matters are. Yes, we can pray for the sick people. We need to pray for sick people. We need to lay hands. Jesus never refused anyone. Anyone who asks for prayer, we're obligated to pray for. Anyone the Holy Spirit leads you to minister to, you must do it. But we have to realize God's biggest concern in any circumstance and situation is the weightier matters of the kingdom. God will spend our lives like money. God will allow an entire city of believers to be persecuted and martyred 
if it's for the sake of the kingdom. And he's saying, I promise you, you will be rewarded on the other side, but I retain the right to spend your life. You can't throw all my promises into the same category. I am God and I am king. And you owe me your life and I can spend it how I will. And I will spend it on weightier matters. This is what settles the dilemma. And Jesus told us this up front. He told us, now listen, I want us to go to this next slide. Mark 8, 34. When he called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Well, wait, I thought I'm the head, not the tail, above and not beneath. Everything I put my hand to is going to prosper. The enemies that come at me in one direction, that you'll cause them to flee in seven. If I'll hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God. And Jesus is saying, yes, that's true. But whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Let him count the promises that are not as weighty a matter as the matters of the kingdom and the gospel. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life and the lightweight blessings will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Now, what's Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, folks, there are weightier matters. The kingdom is a weightier matter. The kingdom and the gospel going through this earth is of a much greater importance than all of the other promises that God has promised you, such as with long life will I satisfy them. If you will walk with me, none of the diseases that come upon the Egyptians shall come upon you. All of your enemies that come against you, no, I will cause them to flee in seven. Are we saying those are not true? They are true to the degree they can be lived without you compromising the weightier matters. Well, well, how do I do that? Oh, Jesus just told us. If you want to be my disciple and you want to walk in all the promises that are yes in me and amen in me, that's great. I'll provide for your every need. Provide it. You deny yourself and take up your cross. Because if you'll deny yourself and take up your cross, you will never compromise the weightier matters. If you'll deny yourself, oh, but God promised it. He did. But he lets us know there are weightier matters. What is our position on the weightier matter? Jesus' position for us on the weightier matter is this. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Well, Lord, what do you mean? I mean this. If you have to joyfully accept the plundering of your goods for the sake of the kingdom and the gospel, do it. If you're not willing to deny that, you're not going to walk in the way to your things. You're not going to be my disciple. You may say you want to be my disciple. And you may walk that way until the weightier matters, and this literally means heavy, the weightier matters weigh in on you and start weighting you down. And you're saying, Lord, I can't bear up under this and keep all of my little blessings. And he's saying, that's right. 
let them go. Let them go because if you're losing them for the weightier matters, you can rejoice. Great, great, great is going to be your reward. If you're persecuted for righteousness sake, rejoice. Why? That's a weightier matter than the temporal blessings. Listen, God blessed his people. God blesses his people. He wants to bless us. And there's been certain times in history that God has been able to bless entire nations, not just because they were perfect and godly, but because evil was not on a rampage that required his people to live such a sacrificial life. There was an abundance of goods. America's been there. But unfortunately, America has neglected and thrown out the weightier matters. And God is saying, whoa, the weightier matters are what most matters to me. And I want America restored to living the weightier matters. And I am preparing. Now, listen, I know we think, oh, judgment's going to come and get all the bad guys. Well, eventually, judgment is going to come and get all the bad guys. But between now and then, while judgment is coming, sometimes the bad guys, unleashed by the evil one against God's people, Therefore, we need to joyfully accept the plundering of our goods and keep our eyes on the weightier matters. This is, the, this is what settles and divides out the dilemma of how can all these promises be yes and amen and bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He takes care of me in every circumstance and situation. Well, he does. He does. And if we're martyred, he's going to take care of us. And if we're locked away in prison for the kingdom's sake and the gospel's sake, he's going to take care of us. It may not be what we were hoping for. I don't know that we'll be ordering takeout and then bringing it into the jail cells. But I do know this. If we're standing for the weightier matters, he will be with us. And that is the weightier matter, that he is with us. Susan read a story about a woman named Helen Rosevere. And so I texted her. I said, tell me that quote again. This is what Jesus spoke to her, Helen. This is a woman who was a single woman who was a medical background, went on the mission field to help these very underprivileged people. I think it was in South America, but I'm not sure. Very underprivileged. And there was a lot of like tribal war warfare going on and she would medically treat both sides and, and all of that. And so both sides kind of respected her in the sense that she was there to preach the gospel to love on people and to help them medically. Then one of the groups that she had helped so much medically saved lives. She had helped so much, the men soldiers came in. She was a single woman. They repeatedly raped her. Now this is a group of like soldiers that she had medically treated and they raped her repeatedly, all of them. Now listen, she's like, Lord, why, why did you let this happen? Where are you? I thought you would be a shield before me in my rear guard, that you would cause the weapons that formed against me not to prosper. And here's what the Lord spoke to her. Can you thank me? This is what the Lord said. Now, you got to think weightier matters. Can you thank me for the privilege 
of me trusting you in the sharing of my suffering, even if I don't tell you why. Now, I'm not sure I read that right, so let me do it again. Can you thank me for trusting you? This is Jesus speaking to her. Can you thank me after being raped by all those men? Can you thank me for trusting you with the privilege, weighty matter here, for the privilege of sharing in my suffering? even if I don't tell you why I allowed it to happen. See, Jesus is thinking weighty matters. We tend to be pretty shallow in our faith. You know, oh, well, Lord, I'm believing you for a new car. I'm believing you for a new job. Lord, I'm believing you for new shoes. And listen, we need shoes. We need shoes in the winter. Thank you, Jesus. We need food. We need a roof over our head. We need a lot of things we need. He knows what we have need of. And he says, ask. I know what you have need of before you ask. Ask. But don't confuse those things with the weightier matters of the kingdom and the gospel. They're not in the same context. Those promises don't belong in the same context. And there was that woman, what a testimony. There was that woman and she joyfully accepted, not the plundering of her goods, the plundering of herself, her dignity, her virginity. All of that was plundered. And Jesus said, can you thank me for trusting you with the privilege of sharing in my suffering for the gospel, for the kingdom? And it changed her. God healed her from the internal, I mean the, the heart internal wounds that she experienced. She still went through it. Jesus went through it. But he's whole now. And she's whole now. But see, this issue then becomes about the weightier matters. And so we need to believe God for the weightier things because the weightier things are things like Noah's Ark. That wasn't just a mission. That was a world saver. Abraham, Isaac, that wasn't just a mission and outreach. That was a world-class saver. Moses, world-class saver. God needs people who believe him and don't just say, oh, well, it's all on the other side, brother. Just whatever happens, happens. No, you're forfeiting gospel and kingdom that God wants established in this generation. You can't just blow everything to the other side and say, well, we'll all get it when we're there. What are we forfeiting by not believing God? We're not believing him anymore. We say, oh, well, God doesn't do miracles anymore. God not only does them, he wants to do them because he's still working kingdom and gospel in this generation. And if they needed it to be confirmed with signs and wonders following, we don't. Our nation's going insane because the church is not walking in the power of God. Because we're not walking with him. Because we don't value the weightier matters. We value the personal lightweight matters. And then whine about God not being faithful. When we don't get our little lightweight, nothing matters matters. We've got to set our eyes on the weightier matters and fight in this life.
for the kingdom and the will of God to be done. Don't just shirk it off and say, well, it'll all work out in the end. How many people are you sacrificing by saying it'll all work out in the end? In this generation, we have a responsibility to believe God to do mighty things in this crazy world. And he's saying, I, I can't even find anybody that believes I can do anything anymore. But he's calling us. Amen. Let's stop. Let's pray. Father, we come to you, Lord. We worship you. Lord, I thank you for your mercy. And Lord, I thank you for stirring us to believe you to be the mighty God you are and that the kingdom is still advancing even in this crazy world. And Lord, help us to see the weightier matters and that we put all of our effort to believe you, to trust you, to do signs, wonders, and miracles, and mighty things in this generation. Lord, that, they, that the, the testimony of Jesus will be confirmed with signs following. Lord, we thank you for this. We don't want to neglect. We don't want to neglect, Lord. Help us to see and understand and deal with our hearts if we've lifted things out of the not so important and made them weightier matters when they're not the weightier matters. Lord, help us to see what the weightier matters are. We thank you for this. We love you. We worship you. And we thank you for the privilege of allowing us to suffer alongside with your sufferings for the sake of the kingdom and for the sake of the gospel. And Lord, we will take up our cross and we're going to follow you. We're going to be disciples. And we thank you for this in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen.